The All Black Podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams in black become the best run teams in sport. To listen to this episode and all the All Black Podcasts, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere you get your podcasts. Kia ora whanau, welcome to the All Black Podcast, powered by SAP. Out of the studio today, back in the community at Waihi Rugby Club. Today's guest needs no intro. As a player, selector and coach, spanning from 1980 to 2017, our guest was involved in 174 All Black Test matches, recording 143 wins. Those 143 wins represent a third of all All Black Test victories in our history. Only coach to win both the Men's World Cup, which he did twice, 211, 215, and the Women's World Cup in 2017. 2022. Welcome to the podcast, Wayne Smith. All Black number 806. That's Rob. Mate, now actually, maybe actually you've been involved for over 200 games. Would that be right? I think um, if you do the mass, it, it could be more than that. Yeah, I think so. I've, I've got a mate in Ireland uh, who got hold of me one day and had all the, had all the stats. I think maybe two, 2009 or 2011, I think. Well, might not have counted because back then you go on tours, weren't you? And matches for the All Blacks weren't necessarily all Test matches. You played midweekers and all that sort of stuff as well, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, I had 17 Tests, as you said. I think I had 35 games as a player. Yeah. So a lot of those are um, were wins too. So that would have added to the winning yeah, yeah. 100% <laughs> to the winning percentage. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were great fun in those days. Mate, All Black number 806, you know, that's, that's probably digging into the archives a bit for us. That's the, that's the one we've gone back the longest on. But I actually wondered, um, we always talk about All Black numbers. Do you know your coach's number? Like, is that a thing? Do you know what number All Black coach you were back then when you became All Black head coach? No. No, we, we need to do something about that, I reckon. No, I don't know. I think I'm number 13 sevens cap. Yeah. It's either 13 or 23, I can never remember. Because you're a great historian but... of the game. I thought you might know which All Black number head no. coach you are. no. <laughs> Well, that's a work on. I'm going to put that in the notes and I'm going to go sort that out. Um, Smithy, really good at lots of things, like, you know, a storied career. Perhaps not so good at retiring. It feels like um, <laughs> every time, you know, you're sort of hanging up the whiteboard that you seem to be uh, dragged into something else. But perhaps you'll always be involved in the game in some way, shape or film, surely. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm hugely obsessed with the game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, whether it's watching it, coaching it, uh, do a lot of these sorts of things, you know, yeah. different podcasts. I mentor a few people as well. Um, I'm in a um, foundation called Pathway One with David Galbraith. Yeah. And uh, we have this philosophy of mentoring people and then getting them to men- mentor people. It's a wee bit like pyramid selling. Yeah, I like you know, it. You create yeah. a whole mentorship. <laughs> Amway, yep. Um, yeah, and for me, uh, like I like to keep a bit busy. I'm, I like the retired or semi-retired life, but I um, always got to have my fix. I've, yeah. I've got a, um, I've always had quite a growth mindset, and I'm always interested in, you know, reading and what's going on and meeting other people. And I've always thought, you know, you are who you are because of the diversity of the people that yeah. you meet and the different perspectives that they have. And if you're prepared to take them on board, you know, you create sort of like a unique you. You're not unique. Yeah. Yeah. in any one way you're unique because you take on things that you like from other people and you become you so yeah I'm yeah I'll keep um active I think for quite a while yet yeah I was when I was uh, getting ready for this one there's a number of podcasts you're on a number of interviews you've done and, and I keep thinking to myself Smithy just just tighten it up a little bit mate keep that good information just here inside New Zealand stop <laughs> contributing to all these coaches overseas and these podcasts overseas but obviously that's sort of a part of your values and and um you know, you're someone who, um, you know, wants to share all this knowledge like you've just discussed, and I suppose to the point you make, it's what you do with the information that you gather over the years, is it? Yeah. I learned something really important from Graham Henry in early 1997. So he was coaching the Blues. They'd won the championship in 96. In those days, you had a Super Rugby conference at the beginning of the year. So I'm a new coach, go along to this conference. Guest speaker is Graham Henry because he'd won the championship the year before. So he proceeded to tell us everything about how the Blues are playing. <laughs> yeah. You know, like nine passes, oh, the eight passes to nine, flat, eight metres wide, you know, different plays that they had. Oh, I'm fascinated. I'm sitting next to um, Frank Oliver and we're writing all this stuff down. Yeah. 
And so I go along to Crusaders and I start adding some of this stuff into what I'm already doing. I'm sure Frank was doing the same. Um, then uh, the next year, 1998, he was a speaker again. Same sort of thing. Gave us all sorts of um, key points about the blues. And same thing, I was writing it down again. And then I realised he's taken us to where they were, sharing his ideas to where they were, but he's already stepped, he's yeah, already gone yeah. forward. Yeah. So he's concentrating on, on getting up there, yeah. whereas he's taken us to there. Yeah. It's quite a good tactic. <laughs> and when we won in 98, yeah. our first one, I was a guest speaker in 99. Yeah, right. And I looked down the audience, there was Frank Oliver writing everything down. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. I wonder if, I, I, doubt they, I doubt they do that these days, would they? Have Don't that? know. Yeah, it'd be interesting. A few warm-up questions before we get into the sort of the life and times of, of Wayne Smith. Favourite favorite All Black growing up, do you remember, or, or even just oh, yeah. players? Oh, yeah, 100%. Had, had his um, photo on the wall, you know, poster on the wall, in Kirkpatrick. Oh, but, legend. But strange, really, for a, yeah. for a back, I was a little wee fella. I was, yeah. a, I was more a sprinter as a kid than a rugby player, and well, I love rugby. Um, yeah, he was, he was my hero. Still is, probably, you know, I, I love yeah. catching up with him, he's... To me, he's sort of taken over that Doyen status, yeah. status that BJ and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Pine Tree had. Yeah. You know, he's, he's an outstanding man. Yeah, and someone of my vintage kind of thinks of that era as, you know, quite one-dimensional rugby, raw bone sort of stuff. But like Kirky, I've heard you speak before, he could play any position. Like he was hugely elusive and actually ahead of his time somewhat in terms of being a rugby player. Yeah, I, like I'm surprised that you said that about the perception being... Um, but one dimensional because from that sixty seven team coached by Fred Allen, I think that set the mm. set the standard for the current teams. You know, big, fast, skilled forwards, everyone could catch and pass. They played fifteen man rugby and uh probably were the greatest greatest team um maybe in their history, the the way they played. And we've often talked about them, you know, when you're talking about DNA and how the All Blacks should play, often we come back to to that, you know, to that team as being the prototype. Totally. I think I might have to do a few podcasts on that era, get people of, uh, get myself educated a bit more on, on how good those guys were. Um, you've coached and mentored so many, uh, but who had a really big effect on you as a player? I've had a lot. Um, you know, you learn constantly off um, off players. I think Daniel Carter, because I was a 10 and I was generally either coaching the back attack or the back defence or counter attack, we had a lot to do with each other. Um, he's he's the best player I've ever coached, yeah. probably the best player I've ever seen. He, unbeknown to him probably, he was teaching me all the time. I think he was teaching me more than I was teaching him. But just little things in his, you know, if, he, if he wanted to be fast and he wanted to execute, you didn't want him looking at too much, yes. you know, because if you try and see everything, you see nothing. And so, getting, you know, limiting what he had to look at, giving him um, solutions rather than problems. So what I mean by that, you know, if the, say a wing sees that there's space in front of him and he wants the ball, instead of just saying to the 10, there's space in front of me, give me the ball, a solution would be, snipe a crossfield kick yeah. or miss two to get it wide or something like that so that if you didn't make Daniel think too much he executed at speed and then wow. then he was magnificent magic happened so yeah I don't know if he he didn't really teach me that I just picked it up from yeah. years of coaching him and, and getting to understand why he was so great and how to help him sort of retain that greatness so good two boys from grassroots New Zealand best player you've marked and why uh, yeah, be several. So Mark Eller would be my first one. Um, Tell us about him a little bit because, you know, someone like myself didn't see him play heaps, you know, like, um, but it's a name you hear about a lot. Like, why was he such a good player? We gave up at 26, I think, Mark, um, to pursue other things. Um, why was he so great? He was an attacking 10. He wasn't really a kicking 10. He could kick and he could goal kick as well, but he was a really attacking 10. He was the most... Um, dangerous 10 I think I've ever played it or I ever played against uh, we became good mates he and Glenn were you know the twins they were they were good mates of mine I think we'd played in the early days we played in an invitation team together 
or against each other, I think, and I, I got to know them there. And then subsequently in 1980, 1984, or 82 as well, 83, 84, playing against them constantly. Um, yeah, he was just really dangerous. I, I also got really close to Ollie, Ollie Campbell in the 83 Lions store, and I'm still in contact with Ollie. He's a good man. And Johnny Rutherford was, you know, was good on that tour as well. A great, great player. Uh, Michael Liner, latterly yeah. Michael Liner, I'd probably put in a similar class to Mark Eller. Yeah. Like, dangerous, um, great player, good mate. I actually coached him at Benetton. Um, but he, yeah, he was... I'd say he and Mark Eller would be the two toughest ones I had to handle. <laughs> <laughs> great names. Is the 1985 Canterbury versus Auckland Shield game the game of the century? Is it the best game ever, Smithy? Um... Yeah, I think think provincially you could classify it as a great game. Yeah. I'm still <laughs> <laughs> I have trouble talking about this one because that John Kerr and batting that last yeah. ball over the yeah. over the goal line. That's a penalty try. It's a penalty all day. And there were two <laughs> two minutes left on the clock because whoever's keeping the clock kept the clock on that yeah. to show there's two minutes left. Um, yeah, we like. We did something really different at the start of that. So we were lined up to go out and Grizz came over and said, I want you to run over the far side and just recognise the crowd, uh, okay. connect with them with a, with a clap of your hands. Capacity, it was out of control, oh, yeah, 50, wasn't it? 50 odd thousand, yeah, and then run to the other, to, to the um, stand side and do the same, give them a clap. And whether it ranged our emotions too much or not put us over the top, I'm not sure, but we went there in that first half. Nah. And then straight after half time, you know, Grizz had come down at half time and just put the ball on the f- ground and said, they've bloody scored by using that. Get in the second half and you can win this game. And off he went. <laughs> and so they scored straight after half time, which put us on the back foot. And then we started taking over. And we got back to, I think, 28, 24. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Something like that. Last play of the game line out on the right hand side I remember saying to Warwick Taylor wasn't wasn't on at that point and um, Wayne Burley was oh, at second five I remember saying to Bills what do you reckon mate we do something such a move he said no nah, Smithy put it up put it up and we'll chase like hell so that's what it was <laughs> I grabbed it put it up bounced about that far from the goal line then yeah. it bounced high yeah. Craig Green was like you watch the photo yeah but the photos is that far away <laughs> Like millimeters Thinking away from on. actually tapping it down, and then and uh, JK bats it away. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you have a couple of beers and discussion about uh, that down here at why he beats you every now and again. Yeah, he pays. <laughs> <laughs> Owes you big time, mate. But that that era must you must look back on that so affectionately. I think you you won the shield in '82. You scored you know a, an excellent try intercept, ran it in from 30 or 40 meters, and apparently a, a first five with a huge amount of speed. Um, you whopped Auckland in 83, I think. Um, yep. I, I read somewhere it was almost a perfect game for you guys. Five tries to zip. Um, you know, Grizz, fantastic coach. I think same thing again. If you'd asked me years ago, my perception of Grizz, it was this tough North Canterbury lad that probably told you to put it up the jumper. But actually, I'm told he's quite innovative and, and actually an excellent coach. And, and over between 82 and 85, 500,000 people came into the stadiums to watch, to watch that um, shield period. I mean... What an awesome time, you know? Oh, yeah. Greatest years of my life, playing with your best mates in the red and black. I actually played with Grizz when he was a captain, and uh, I remember my first first few weeks with him, we had two moves off the scrum. One was, <laughs> one was right arm and one was left arm. <laughs> and so when he came in as coach, um, I knew him pretty well. I, was, yeah. I knew him well enough to be terrified of him. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, he... He really created a great team with Dougie Bruce. So Dougie Bruce was really important to yeah. me. Um, ex first five, great thinker of the game. wasn't so much a drills and skills type guy, but I'd always wanted to sit down, and have a chat, and talk about how to do this and how to do that. And when you see this, you know, do that. And so they were a great, they were a great pairing. I had some good coaches in my life, and they were they were two of the great ones. If Wayne Smith hadn't been a rugby player and a coach, what would he have been? I was trained as a school teacher. Um, I left teaching reasonably early because I'd made the All Blacks, and in those days you never got paid f- when you're away on tour. You know, you'd, you'd tour 
Um, I got a couple of tours of Australia away for three months, basically, same with um, UK. And so I had to find something that, you know, I had a young family eventually and had to find something that would pay me while I was away. So I started working for Canterbury Sports Depot um, in the centre of, in Cashel Street in Christchurch. And so Murray Smith, who was the owner, he, he paid me while I was away. I'd make up to him as much as I could, so I'd, I'd go and take photos of um, sports shops. You know, I, I remember being down um, at Lily White's in London yeah, and taking exactly. photos of them, and they were yeah, trying good. to stop me taking the photos, but I was <laughs> wanted to bring them home and show you know, how we could set things up and that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he really looked after me, and then I would, I would work Saturday mornings to make up time. So I'd work Saturday morning, and then I'd play Saturday afternoon for Belfast. And at one point near the end of my career, I was working Saturday morning, playing for Belfast, and then if I got an opportunity, I'd play for Kashmir oh. in the soccer. Awesome. After that, played a couple of games for them after the, <laughs> after the rugby. <laughs> I had a couple of mates in the team. No wonder you're fit. <laughs> Mate, what do you do to relax? Like, I, I have visions of you lying in bed at night and waking up and, and writing moves down and <laughs> writing notes down and, and like you say, you know, every moment you've got, you're sort of studying the game in some way, shape or form or, or sharing thoughts and ideas with someone. But can you switch off? Do you relax? You live in a beautiful part of the country when you're here. Yeah, I can relax. I, I, the worst place for me to relax is lying in bed because yep. I do, I wake up constantly and I have my phone on my bed and I write things down. I'm doing, <laughs> yeah. I'm doing a bit of work I knew with... It. I knew it. Yeah, I'm doing a bit of work with Phil Gifford at the morning and things come back into my... Uh, at, this, at, at the moment and things come back into my head and I yeah. write down, I must tell him this tomorrow, I must tell him that. Um, yeah, but I can relax. I'm, I'm enjoying having a bit of time out. Um, Trish and I like to travel. We've got grandkids. We've had them, them up here for a while um, over the holidays. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed, way more relaxed these days than what I was. I, I set myself really, when I moved into coaching, I wanted to be the best, yeah. and I set myself, um, when I look back, probably ridiculous parameters. I'd, I'd look at, for example, I looked at, I'd read about Eddie Jones, what time he came in in the morning, what time he left at night, and I made sure I came in to work to my coaching office like a half an hour before him and then left a half an hour after him and often I'd have nothing to do I'd just sit there and look at my watch and, <laughs> and but I so, did a longer day than Eddie <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah so I did a few stupid things like that but I was just so um, so adamant that I was going to prove to everyone that I could I could be successful I'm going to I mean I was going to ask a bit later on but I'll ask it now like because I've, I've heard stories you know from when you were first in the All Black setup that you were you were Defensive coach, attacking coach. You were doing your own coding. You know, like you were you're doing, yep. you know, four or five jobs. And and you know, has that been a part of your evolution, evolution or, or your growth? You've been able to trust others and work with others and give them, you know, the reins on on different parts of the game rather than trying to do absolutely everything yourself. Yeah, it's much easier these days because you've got staff around you. Yes. You know, if, um, when I first when I first joined John Hart in the All Blacks, for example, was '98 and '99. I'd been working with a um, Spanish professor of biochemistry, um, George Cyrillac, on a computerised analysis system. Yeah. I'd met him in '95 in Melbourne at a sports conference, and I'd I'd read that this um, the Spanish guy was presenting on computerised soccer analysis. So I thought I'd go along to that lecture, and there's me and like three soccer people in the lecture <laughs> in this area, and they left pretty quickly. And so I was left there by myself with George at the end of the lecture, and I went up and said, "Does uh, like any do any soccer teams have this George working with you on it?" He said, "No soccer teams want it." He oh. said, "Not even Barcelona, and that's my team." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Do you know anything about rugby?" And he said, "I know nothing about rugby." <laughs> I said, "Well, you know, if you could, if we could change this to rugby, I, I would definitely use it." Yeah, and so we set about we go. a two-year project of um, getting help. So Graham Murray was was yeah. another one who helped. Yeah. A guy called David Hadfield, who was one of our top sports psychs, he got involved, and a mate of mine, Brendan Ratcliffe, who coached with me, he'd been a mate all my life, and he co coached with me at Northampton. We spent a couple of hours, uh, uh, not a couple of hours, a couple of years, <laughs> yeah. teaching George what all the skills were of rugby. I think we had come up with about two thousand tasks over all that time, because this was a complex um, system. And so, yeah, so I was able to use the first 
computer, I think, in, certainly in rugby, right. and it was like it was that big, had wheels on it, weighed 43 kilos. And I used to lug it around <laughs> for the Crusaders and then for the for the All Blacks. And as it improved, obviously, then to laptops yeah. today, it's been become a lot easier. But you had to do everything yourself in those days because, yeah. you know, that that you had um, if you're lucky, you had one assistant. Yeah coach or one co-coach and that was that um, you had to write your own strategic plans you had to basically do everything yeah. and so it was a, a hell of a big task and when professionalism came it was um, even bigger because there were more expectations of you yeah any three guests to dinner alive or dead who are they what are you cooking smithy i get this one asked quite a bit but it's normally just one and i always say Anika Moa. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love her to come to my place for dinner. She's a character, absolutely. Yeah, character. Um, I love her songs. Uh, even her lost songs for Bubba's are great. But yeah, she's a character. She'll yeah. be good to have a wine with, I'm picking. Yeah. Um, definitely JK. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, he provide the wine. Yeah. That's the first thing. Good company. Uh, great company. He'd look after your mental health. Yes, so totally. there'd be no problem. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and he created a bit of debate. Yeah. So he'd be, a, yeah, he's always interesting. Third one uh, for me was John John Wooden. Okay. So John Wooden coached UCLA to 12 champion, national championship victories yep. in basketball. And he's sort of my coaching hero. Like, he's someone that I, I loved his philosophy and I read all his books. And uh, Gilbert and Oka and I were at a conference in Redondo Beach in um, LA in 2007 and had the opportunity to go and visit John Wooden. So I went along and had a cup of um, tea with him. And I wanted to ask him some questions about, because I'd read his books and I was fascinated at this, his theory of, or his, his philosophy of, it's not winning the race that counts, it's how you run it. Right. It's more important. And so we're having a chat there and I'm asking a lot of things in his, in his little, little apartment he was in. And you know when you watch basketball movies yeah. at the end of the game all the time there's a there's a time out end yeah. of the game <laughs> yep. coach gets the board out and he has Absolutely. the x's and the o's and you're going to go there you're going to fake there you're going to go there i'm going to pass to you you're going to pass to him and then you're going to yep. get, the, get the winning goal so i wanted to check that john was true to what he'd said in his books so i asked him and the last time out in each of those 12 championship victories what would you say to the team what'd you what'd you do and he said, I said the same thing in each of those 12 victories. Right. I said, what was it? He said, when the final whistle goes, don't make fools of yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> okay. oh, how beautiful is that? Yeah. Mate. No X's or O's, Just, no yeah. fake plays, don't make fools of yourselves. Because he's, he's all about people, all about the humility of the sport yeah. and playing it well. So I loved it. How good. Smithy, you, growing up in Taru, a bit of a hotbed for New Zealand rugby, actually, in, in some ways. Um, fond memories, you know, was it rugby and bare feet from three years old? Like, is that what it looked like for you? Yeah. I, I think the first boots I had was when I was 12. There it is. And I remember we played a lot of games in Tokoroa as well, and you'd go there like 9 o'clock in the morning. You imagine the frost oh, yeah. back in those days in Tokoroa, and you'd be jumping on from one foot to the other. Um, <laughs> Pataru, I went to Pataru High School. Um, talk about Pataru being a hotbed. Pataru High School back in those days was a powerhouse. You used to knock over Hamilton, didn't you? Yeah, you beat Hamilton boys the year I was there. We had you know, some of the best players in the country, Ohio brothers, our yep. twin boys in midfield. Had a mate of mine, John Rawson, on one wing and um, Rod Walker on the other, who was New Zealand 400 champ. And, you know, you'd, I was probably the seventh best maybe in the team yeah yeah matter matter high i think we're rated first in the country and we drew with them for the trickler and the i think they had the masker as well um had to play the game at in morrinsville yeah at the stadium because it was too big the crowds were too big in those days for schools yeah so it was a it was a powerhouse and even at senior level you know um my dream really was to to play for patera athletic and when i went to university a group of us used to come back and and play for Pataru seniors. So um, there are a lot of really great players that have come out of there. You know, um, Foxy's one, so I, we knew the Fox family pretty well. Yep. He went to Auckland Grammar, obviously, yeah. but I, I used to watch him as a little kid, you know, kicking. He used to kick 
for like two hours even as a little kid <laughs> yeah. for practicing. Um, I had Mark Granby across the road. I used to babysit um, Mark Granby. So his, dad, his dad was um, minister at the yeah. St. Aidan's Church. Um, Ian Foster, so Jack Foster, Ian's old man, he used to cut my hair up <laughs> Princess Street in Pataru. So Ian Foster came from there. The Woods, um, Dave Wood had um, son Ian Wood, who played for Palms, uh, played for Manawatu and played New Zealand Juniors and New Zealand A, I think. Um, so yeah, a lot of really good players came out of there. It's pretty cool, isn't it, that you that game we talked about before in '85, like your first five on one side, Foxy's first five on the other, two kids from Pataru going at you know domestically one of the biggest games we've ever had in New Zealand. Do you ever chat about that? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah. Like, to have that connection and then for you to go and be such substantial parts of New Zealand rugby at the higher levels as well. Yeah, no, it's interesting. From so he played in the '83 game for Auckland, and that's the first time I'd ever played against him. So uh, yeah, you could see straight away that he had composure and he had something special about him. Um, he came on tour to Fiji in 1984, mm. and he talks about this often because, uh, like I knew through working with him in Fiji, um, having p kicking practices with him every day, I knew he was, like he was my apprentice I suppose at that point, but yeah. it wasn't going to be long before he took over. Yeah. Um, I could see the outstanding parts of him in his first so his first game for the All Blacks, I decided to go into his room and grab his boots. And I gave him a bit of a polish and put them outside his door. And it was sort of like, um, for me, it was like, I oh, know you're going to be a great at the game. Yeah. Don't worry, mate. Just, I'm backing you. Go out and do it. And um, then I, yeah, I must have been a good selector because <laughs> he was a great at the game. Uh, yeah, no, he's really special. And so by, um, by the end of 85, uh, you know, Trish and I, our twin boys, were three, and I wasn't getting to see them much. Yep. I wasn't, um, you know, you're away on tours, you're away with Canterbury, you're club rugby, you're training every night virtually. If you're not training club at night, you're training Canterbury. Um, so it was, it was getting to a point where I needed to give some time to family. And I knew that 87 World Cup was coming up, um, but there was another young footballer coming through called Frano Bodica. Mm. Who I'd seen play for the Colts and we trained against them in 84 in Australia when I was with the All Blacks and he was there with the Colts. And I remember Warwick Taylor, <laughs> Taylor saying to me, Jeepers, how are we going to handle this kid? He's <laughs> so, just like, quick. Uh, so he was another one coming through and yeah, yeah and I left to go and play a coach in, in Casale Sulsile in Italy because my time was my time was done. I, like I might have made the 87 team but um, no, I just I felt it wasn't right. Yeah, it was time for me to give to the family. Mate, you you know you're well known for the analytical side. You know, nicknamed Professor these days. But sort of that EQ that comes when you talk about doing those things for Foxy, almost a not a passing of the baton, but but that sort of gesture. I've heard people like Anton Leonard Brown speak really fondly of when you came and spoke to his family and and some of the things you did around that. Where does that come from? Like, is that something that came from your parents and from your upbringing that that side of it as well, that, you know, your attention to detail around people, you know, which seems to be maybe maybe one of your best traits as a coach, you know, amongst many. Well, I was brought up in Patera, obviously, 50s and 60s. Um, yeah, you know, there were no wealth. I can't remember wealthy people back <laughs> yeah. in those days. Yeah, yeah. We're all the same. You all lived in, if you went in a state house, you are in an ex-state house. Yeah. Um, so there's no elitism anything like that. Mum and Dad, Christian people, Mum in particular, was a, she was an elder at St Aidan's Church. Um, you know, and you, and you were, they were a lot stricter in those days, parents. Yep. You know, and you were constrained to certain behaviours, weren't you? So, um, I guess you learn, you learn through that. With regards to what I did for Foxy, that was more um, having people like Murray Mixted and Andy Hayden, for example, being kaitiakis of or guardians of the jersey when I first got in the All Blacks, and Mix and I we, we remember this differently. <laughs> but I thought so. He and Andy took me out for a beer early on in the '80 tour, my first All Black tour. And what I remember is, you're not good enough yet to be an All Black, and these are things you got to do. You know, but we don't think you're good enough. That's what I took 
Yeah, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's talked, what I heard. <laughs> you talked to Max. It was no, no, no. It was these are the values we expect, and this right. is what needed to be in All Blacks. And I'm sure it was that way. I just heard one thing, yeah. um, but it made an impression on me that we actually do have a responsibility once you get experienced as an All Black or Canary player to to pass on what you know to create a like the legacy in the All Blacks is very much. You're a steward of the jersey, and it's your job to make it better. And so, when you leave the team, you hand it on to the next person. Hopefully, the jersey will be in a in a better spot. So it's something that drives you constantly. And um, and so, yeah, it's just you know, you have a everyone has a role to play as a carer or a, or a guardian of whichever team they're in. I think, and that's what I was doing, carrying on what others had taught me. Do you remember being named in the All Blacks? It's a big moment and never forget that yeah, like never. How, how did that happen for you it, it's for, always a little bit for different me for, um, for me it was unbelievable and I don't say that for, through humility at the end of 78 so during the 78 season I, it was my last year at university I was um, finishing an honours degree in social science and I wanted to go to teach college so I was starting to think about that but I wanted to play for Waikato so I got selected for the um to start in the Queen's birthday match against Auckland. Uh, I got picked because Murray Taylor and Ross McGlashan and Andy Baker, who are all ahead of me, they were all injured. And so I was, I was picked to start. So I think half of Tauru came over <laughs> to watch me play. Went to the Riverina Hotel that morning um, to prepare and was told, no, I wasn't going to start. And um, I think they just got cold feet at the end, thinking, no, he's not good enough to start. So um, they put a mate of mine, actually, who who um, was a really good player from from Matamata College, Al Hopson. He he played first five that day, and he played well. And Waikato beat Auckland. So I sat in the stand. That's the closest I ever got to, to the Waikato rep team. I, I was in the 21s, and I had a couple of games for the Bs. And at the end of 78, my 21s coach came and said, look, um, the Waikato coach has had a chat to me and he doesn't think you're going to be a first five as long as you ask points downwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I looked at myself, well, he's probably right at the time. Like, <laughs> yeah. I had a long way to go, clearly. But um, he could only see the outside of me. Yeah. He couldn't see what I had inside me, the, the drive that I had and the, and the competitiveness and... Um, what I was prepared to do to, to be a top class player. So anyway, I decided I could go to either Auckland Teachers College or or Canterbury. They were the two left. <laughs> I decided to go to Canterbury. I had some relations there. Um, Ross McGlashan, who also played in Pataru and, and Matamata, he encouraged me to go to the Christchurch Club when I got down there and he gave me a number to ring for Guy Penny who'd been his halfback. So I went to the trials 97 trialists back in those days. Didn't get my boots out of the car. Hopped in the car, went home. Robbie Deans was first five for Christchurch. Hopped in the car, um, went back to where I was staying with my uncle and auntie, and he worked at Belfast. Um, he said to me, well, Belfast got a senior team. Why don't you come out there? I don't think they got any backs. So you might make that team. So <laughs> that's what I did. There went, it is. And, went and played for Belfast. Um, a lot of luck is there. There's always luck in a career, you know, and I, I had a bit of luck. Um, ended up in the Canterbury team with Chris as captain. Um, I got Young Player of the Year, I think, that year. And by the end of 1979, I was non travelling reserve for the All Blacks. <laughs> now, think about that. Told Can't make Waikato. End of 78, I'm not going to be a first five as long as my ass points downwards to um, be a non travelling reserve. So that's, that's pretty... Um, it's pretty random. It's pretty difficult to take in, yeah. you know, for, I was, what, 21? I was 22. And uh, so I remember training constantly while the All Blacks were away in, in Britain. And my mate, Karen Kane, yeah. um, was in that team, 79 team. Uh, to be, I've got to be truthful here, I was always hoping that either Murray Taylor or Eddie Dunn would get a bit of a strain somewhere <laughs> I might get called over never happened um, and then 
irony on irony, the, the next year All Black Trials are at Rugby Park in Hamilton, my old haunting ground, and I got selected to go in the trials. So in front of um, my home crowd, um, at the stadium I always wanted to play rep rugby for, I got selected for the All Blacks and um, a bit different to today, so you stand underneath, you, you go underneath the stand, okay. have a couple of beers, all the trialists are there together, the chairman gets up on the on a chair or something and reads out the team and so you might be standing next to someone who, who made it or didn't make, make it. So just, Smith had to wait a wee while or? You'd migrate, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You'd migrate to uh, <laughs> to where the team was and where the ones that weren't selected were. So, um, yeah, I'd never forget that occasion. Mate, so good. You must have played all right that day. Yeah, had, um, we're really lucky, had Mark Donaldson inside me, who was captain yeah. of that. I think we were possibles, the other team was probables. Um, I had lucky um, Cameron outside me. Tim Twigden was at centre. Um, and yeah, we went really well. We beat, we, we beat the other team, so that helps. And got a, got a heap of our team into the All Black team for the um, 1980 tour. One of the real disappointing things for me when I heard the team was one of my heroes, Bruce Robertson, didn't make it, and he was in the he was in the team that lost. Yeah. He got left out. He made it subsequently. He made it because of injuries into that tour, but he was great at the game, wasn't he? And uh, yeah. yeah, I was gutted that he wasn't going to be there when I'd actually made it. Can you remember being handed the jersey for the first time, putting it on? Because you know, so often I hear. Uh, all Blacks speak about, you know, you're not truly an All Black until you run on the field and, and have that first Test match. Um, do yeah, you remember got... who passed it to you and that sort of stuff? Uh, no, I can't, I can't remember it being a, a big sort of jersey presentation like it is today. But I remember putting it on before I went to bed and looking at myself in the mirror, <laughs> yeah. shaking my head. <laughs> uh, we played Sydney that day, which was the New South Wales team. I was marking the first time I marked. Mark Eller. Um, we drew that game. I got a droppy on full time. And the Sunday News used to have a Sports Person of the Week award. And Trish rang me to say, that this is the following week, rang me to say, uh, Toaster Sandwich Maker had turned up and I got <laughs> Sports Person of the Week. <laughs> how good. In my, in my very first game. So, yeah, I'm proud of that. Well, there we go. Absolutely. It's amazing how those sort of things stick with you. Uh, 35 games, 17 test matches. Uh, any favourite games stick out and reasons? Uh, you know, it seems like you had some fantastic battles with Aussie at the time. Yeah. The French as well. Like, there's some quite... Actually, one thing that's really <laughs> notable, just how close. Like, so many of those games are either way within a point, couple of points yeah. to try of each other. Like, yeah. French... Um, so, I played French when they came out in 84. Les Garbera was first five. They had um, Salar at second five. In Trans at centre, um, Serge Blanco at Stacked. full back. And we had, a, we had a really good back line, so Warwick outside me, my great mate, Stephen Polkett, who was centre. Um, JK, I think, played in that series. Uh, Huey was at full back, I think. And they were so good, and they were such magicians with the ball. We brought in a call of Pop Black. Which meant if you don't know where the ball is, just tackle the bloke in front of you. <laughs> and a couple of times, he had like four all black backs tackling four <laughs> French backs with the hope that one of them had the ball. Uh, they shot a bigness at, at Lancaster Park. Les Scarborough missed four drop goals in a row. Yeah. And I swapped jerseys with him and his jerseys in the Belfast club rooms. And, I'm, and I should never wash his jerseys because it's got Les Scarborough's tears down the. Wow. Down the front of it, yeah. Um, yeah, because he was really emotional afterwards. And then we, um, then we played them the second test up in Auckland and gave him a bit of a hiding. I remember Faroo, the coach, going in the paper the next day and said we played like babies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the greatest game for me in an All Black jersey, I think, was '84, the third test against Aussie. So we had lost the first test, and second test was in Queensland and we were 12 nil down after eight minutes. Um, I still remember Mark Eller having a drop at goal. It came off the crossbar back into his hands and he scored under the sticks. What? And he kicked the conversion, kicked the, 
kicked a um, couple of penalties and we were our eyes were out on stalks and you know and we fought our way back in that game fought our way back um, won that test we were playing some brilliant rugby against the provincial teams had a great preparation for the third test but Warwick Taylor had broken a bone in his cheek and he was a key player um, Arthur Stone came in I'd never I had played with Arthur Stone for Waikato age grade team but um, this level you know it was a big it was a big ask because he had, he had a magnificent game we played really well we only won 25-24 but that Aussie team went on to win a Grand Slam in Europe later in the year so um, that's probably the two best teams in the world at the time going at each other and um, yeah we we played really well that day and it's one that really sticks out in my mind. Smithy, you know, um, transitioned into coaching. Was that always on the cards? And, and maybe talk about some of your first experiences, you know, as a coach. Yeah, um, was it on the cards? Yeah, I think so because, you know, back in the day when I played for the All Blacks, for example, you only ever had one coach. <laughs> yeah. And so the coach would often say, particularly when I was a bit more experienced, they'd say, oh, Smithy, you take the backs away and... Froggy, Andy Dalton, you take the forwards away, or Jock, you take the forwards away, you know, and then he would go between the two. And you weren't coaching, but you were just sort of setting up the plays and that sort of thing. Um, but it does give you some experience in terms of that, you know, being able to talk and organise the boys and, you know, there's what we're going to do, there's the play we're going to do now, boys, and get on with it. So you get a bit of a head start. Um, I was always going to be a coach. Well, it wasn't professional in those days, clearly, the game, so I never saw it as a, as a vocation. When I went to Italy, I got talked into being the coach as well as the foreign player for Casali. And these were the years when all the best players in the world were in Italy. So, like, Rovigo, just down the road from us, had Nas Bother and Gert Small. Uh, Craig Green and John Kirwan were at Benetton. David Campisi, David Knox were at Petrarca. So... All around the place there are these great players and there was me at Casali <laughs> and I'm coach. And not only that, I'd said to them, I need a forward coach yeah. and the forward coach needs to speak English because I don't speak any Italian yet. No one in the town spoke Italian. We're a little town of like 4,000 people. I say, you need, a, need to be a forward coach, need to speak Italian. And I turn up and it's a guy called Renzo Ganzula who played on the wing for Italy. <laughs> <laughs> only spoke dialect from Venice and used to, used to wear a red bandana around his head as a communist <laughs> and he definitely didn't know how to coach forwards any better than I did so um, we had to work it out together and you can imagine I became, we became great mates yeah. outstanding mates so I had a, um, had a manager there Dino Menegazzi who's probably one of my greatest mates in the world and he unfortunately passed away um, just before the World Cup started last year, so I couldn't get over the funeral, but I'm going over in June to visit the family. He was a great man, um, and we managed to play well, even though neither of us had really coached. <laughs> <laughs> no one coached the forwards. Uh, but we played well, and we stayed up in first division for a couple of years. Uh, yeah, it was it was just a great experience. And I sort of I got the bug when I came back. Um, I got a position as um, director of coaching for Canterbury, only problem is, in those days, amateur days, if you're a paid servant of the Aye. union, you couldn't coach a rugby team. And so the only that, way was around that it... amateur vocation at the time or something? You, had, you could work for anyone else and get paid, but you couldn't work for a rugby union, right. get paid and, and coach a rugby team. So, um, so I started up a company called Triline Promotions and the company got the job as right. director of coaching for <laughs> Canterbury <laughs> and I became a contractor to the company. There you go. So I got paid by the company, not by Canterbury Rugby Union. So that's how we got around it. I played one more year for, um, in the South Pacific competition, I think it was, for Canterbury. Unexpected, really. Um, I just got asked to to go and play and give a bit of experience, I suppose. And then I dropped down to Canterbury B. So I played the rest of the year at Canterbury B. I sort of like a player coach with John Phillips. Um, captain was Steve Hanson. Canterbury B was always strong. We mm. always had a strong team. After that year, John Mills and I took over coaching the, the team. 
Steve was there again. He was um, he played quite a few games for Canterbury A as well, Steve Hanson. But yeah, he was um, he was a real leading light of Canterbury B rugby. So he had a couple of fantastic years there. Um, I'd met Gilbert and Oka back in '83, and he'd been helping me as a player um, in terms of mental skills, imagery, and stuff like that. Bit of goal setting. And so I decided to use him with Canary B as, as a sports psych. Couldn't tell the uh, union, obviously, because uh, they would never accept a sports psych. <laughs> I had to tell the union he was a uh, masseur <laughs> so he could join the team. So we used to, the boys used to have like a A4 excise book, A5 excise book. They'd bring their pens along and we'd have a 20 minute session twice a week on mental skills training. This is an 88, 89. Did you frame it as mental skills training, you know, or did yep. the boys buy into it? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. We call it, you know, this is this is your rugby Bible. Yep. Um, take your notes at the front. In the middle, we want some what-ifs. That's where you're going to keep your what-ifs. And at the back, that's a glossary of terms so that you can understand, right. you know, what does in the present mean, what does next task mean. And, you know, and so we started a whole process of guiding these guys and how to be mentally prepared for a game and how to handle the stresses on the field. And uh, it was superb. It was just, just brilliant. I nearly got caught out <laughs> over Gilbert <laughs> at the National Sevens tournament because I took him to the Sevens as well and they sent a, the council sent a, a member up, I'm pretty sure to spy, <laughs> to make sure that Gilbert was a masseur. And I, I had to send him over the road to get some rubbing oil. And he came back with peanut oil. I remember saying to him, we don't want to fry them, we just want to rub them, mate. But he did, he rubbed them while this bloke watched and he rubbed all the players. And we kept up the charade for quite a while <laughs> with the facade. Um, and it wasn't until, it wasn't until Crusaders really that he became an accepted member of a team. Yeah. Wow. Mate, all those years ago, you look back now like, are some of the things you learned or put into place then, you know, around some of the things you're saying, um, you know, almost people first, theming, you know, asking questions perhaps rather than sort of saying this is how it is, you know, they become foundations of what you did, even though I'm sure you added all these strings to the bow, bow over time. So like, did that stuff stick? Yeah, like, none of us are unique, are we? We're, we're sort of, where you become yourself based on, I think, what you've learned off other people, um, who you like, sorts of ideas you like, you know, you take them on board. A wee bit like that Graham Henry story, you know. You, yep. For me, anyway, um, it's hard to invent anything new in coaching or in the game. And anything almost these days. And anything, yeah. And so you're looking for. Um, I read a lot. Of, I read a lot of books. I had a whole library of business management and coaching books and so I read and read and read and I took ideas out, met a lot of different people, went to a whole lot of different sports to see what they were doing, you know, um, AFL, rugby league, baseball, Ken Revisa was a good mate of mine before he passed in the States, one of the top sports likes in baseball. And so you just, yeah, you, you hear something or you see something, yeah, that's something else I'm going to take on board and something else and then you become who you are, I think. Well, that's, that's how I've done it. That's, I'm who I am now because of a whole lot of other influences. Mate, you've, you've had so much success and we'll chat about that, but also looking back in reflection, you know, there's some, some challenges that, that you often refer to or things you had to work through, whether it being a young coach, you know, taking on the All Blacks um, and, and, you know, actually hadn't been a coach that long when you got that job, you know, perhaps 2000 World Cup or, or other times. Is there some events you think back now where you, while challenging, learnt the most? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, I won't talk too much about them because Phil Gifford will kill me. We're writing a book together, and um, <laughs> that's a big part of the book. Noted. <laughs> Noted. Uh, but yeah, um, I think when it can be overwhelming, particularly when the game turned professional and you're involved with the All Blacks, which is the greatest team in the world, um, it can be overwhelming the different jobs you've got to do, the, the expectations. Um, not a lot of staff helping in those days, even though. It, it was professional, um, so yeah, it was it was really really challenging. Mate, was it? Um, you know, it's often said they. You know, we've had you know a bit of discussion around all black coaches in the last couple of months, and and often a 
a line that comes in is that to be a successful fullback coach, you have to have done some time overseas, um, have that on your CV. Um, that's something that's really going to help. You know, it's something you did, it's something Steve Hansen did, etc. Like, you had time in in Northampton. What's your thoughts on that? And like, um, you know, how was your time in your Northampton? Did it really shape what you did in your second crack um, with the New Zealand rugby team? Yeah, as like everything else, it's part of yeah. Uh, it's another experience. Is it essential? No, I don't think it's essential. Um, people have used that argument about Razor, you know, should he go overseas to coach, to get the experience to coach the All Blacks? I don't think so. Can't hurt, yeah. um, but it's not essential, I don't, I don't think. I love Northampton, and again, um, you have to read my book, mate, but <laughs> uh, I absolutely loved it. I loved the, the owners, Keith and Maggie Barwell. It was a PLC, the club, owned by the fans, yeah. just to say that they owned 87% of the shares, but the whole back of the stand at Franklin's Gardens, the names of the shareholders, and there are thousands of them. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a club for the people. A bit unique in the sense there wasn't a massive football team around. It was It's a bit of a rugby town, Northampton, yeah, isn't it's it? Yeah, it's a rugby town. So the Cobblers are a, an ever-present football team, and they're always around sort of Div B yep. of um, the higher than regional... Yep. Competition, though. I think national it's national. Competition. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're pretty good, but yeah, it's a it's a rugby town. It's a fifteen thousand seater stadium. All the seats are normally sold as season ticket holders. So it's, from a cash flow point of view, it's good. They uh, they operate really well. Um, the I just loved it. You know, the we live Trish and I and the kids live next door to the Franklin's Gardens Stadium. Franklin's Gardens in the old days was a zoo, and. <laughs> It was a mid-1850s 18, maybe 1850s that a local priest used to take some of the wild boys down there and kick a football, kick a ball around. There we are. And even today, there's, um, you can see where the lion's den was and where the bear pit was, and there's fishing lakes. It's all set amongst fishing lakes. So it's got a huge history. Yeah. Um, and I loved, I loved everything about that club. Uh, and again, um, I won't say too much, but I wasn't keen to come back. Yeah. Trish wasn't <laughs> either, was she? What's that? Trish wasn't either, was she? No, Trish was not keen. <laughs> kids, kids weren't keen. There was, um, for me, it, it wasn't, I, had, I held nothing against New Zealand Union. I wasn't pleased with what had happened, but um, yeah, I can't say the same for Trish and the kids. <laughs> they weren't happy. <laughs> they probably needed the a couple was, more years to call off. The way they? I was treated. Yeah, yeah. but um, anyway, came back and uh, I think for myself, I, I need to prove to myself that I was resilient enough to do it. Yeah. And that, but, I, could, and that I could handle it. So. Yeah, I was going to ask that. In, in the end, whether it was the pitch to Trish and the kids or, or whether it was something within yourself, was it just. Um, unfinished business was it that a good friend had reached out to you for help you know like was was there anything that no, was just all that. Above? It, was, it was more about I wouldn't prove myself yep. to myself really that um, that I could do it it was your challenge sort of thing I know yep. you often say it's got to be other yeah. people's I did, I did want to prove to others as well but essentially I want to prove to myself that I had the, the guts to come back and face it and, and do it again Mate, when you got back, yeah, it was different times, probably 2004, new coaching team and, and almost in some regards re-establishing the team. I remember a little bit like, you know, you, you know you're very much a coach with a reputation of um, being progressive and an attacking mindset. But actually a little bit of 2004, I feel like I remember it being a little bit around establishing the set piece again, getting the contact side of the game right. And actually right in front of your nose was um, guys who ended up being some of our best ever, you know, mm. Dan Carter, yeah. Richie McCall, Manonu, Kevi. Um, you know, what was it like in 2004, sort of um, getting the team going? And, and did you know you had those those little bits of gold in front of you with, with the player pool? Uh, yeah, we did. We, we knew that there were going to be some outstanding players, but there always are. Yeah. You know, whatever All Black team you're coaching or you're in, there's always outstanding players. The... A couple of things surprised me when I came back. The first thing was they hadn't moved moved on from the what I thought were real negative um, the court sessions that they had after games. Uh, yep, so yep. that was one thing that I was pretty disappointed in. I thought I thought that would have that would have been a bit modernised by them, but it wasn't. I know it's part of the game, but um, 
you know it's it's okay if it's if it's short and it's a um, and it's fun, but um, that wasn't always the case at that level. The um, yeah. I hear what you're saying about the forward pack. I think the thing I remember most about sort of two four and two five was the flat back line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone was into me about my flat back line. Yeah. And this is when Smithy, not all the things that you're putting in place were necessarily accepted, isn't it? No, nah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm a real believer in in playing on top of teams. Yeah. And everyone, if you're if you're on the field and you're not on, you're not actually catching the ball, you need to be a threat somewhere. Yep. Because the whole game's about um, you know shaping the other team. You want to force them all to defend everyone and all have to come forward in defence, and then you get quick ball. You're attacking a, a retreating team right across the field. And so it took a wee while for my flat back line <laughs> yep. to, to get going, but um, to be able to play flat and on top. You've got to teach a certain set of skills yep. that allow you to catch and pass quickly. Um, Over the top of both legs and all this sort of yeah, stuff, play, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, off either foot. Yep. Um, take the tick out because um, you've got time to... I love a load up. ...do the big <laughs> swing like I used to do. <laughs> yeah, you <know>? totally. <laughs> um, so there's a whole lot of things. You get, and it, it takes a while. And I remember the media really getting into me. And then in 2004, it was just a little story, but um, 2004 we were playing Aussie and Eddie Jones coach of Aussie and uh, they interviewed Eddie Jones and asked him what do you think of Smith's flat back line this tells you how I hold a grudge <laughs> he said nah that, that never work you know we tried that at Randwick it didn't work then it won't work now he doesn't know what he's doing um, blah 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 and really really put some pressure on me so the media really getting into me now 2005 comes and we started to play pretty well <laughs> And the flat back line's going better. <laughs> and Eddie's lost a few games. Yeah. So they come to Eden Park. I get asked by the Aussie media, what do you think of Eddie Jones' game plan? And I say, well, you know, that paint by numbers sequencing, you know, it, it's never worked before and it's not going to work now. <laughs> and he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> Basically, I repeated back what he said about me. And then after the game, we, we beat them at at um, Eden Park upstairs um, I don't know how many he's lost in a row at this point probably four or five and I see him across the room and he raised his bottle at me having a style layer, I think it wasn't and then he came across the room to me and I said look mate sorry for what I said in the newspaper but I've got a long memory and he said yeah, no, no worries, mate. He had, <laughs> yeah. he had the biggest smile on his face and he clicked glasses. <laughs> and I realised it's just a buddy. It's yeah. a game to him. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's a Still game. playing it, mate. Right, Still held playing it inside, it. mate. I'd held it inside. <laughs> <laughs> Cut you deep. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So um, an, that's another, um, what do they call them today, learning? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Oh, mate, that's a great insight. Um, look, there's, like you say, 2005 magnif magnificent series. Um, you know, against the Lions, and and actually, when you go through that period from 2005 through to the World Cup and into 11, and even in between the World Cups, there's some magnificent rugby that sort of gets tucked away a little bit, to be honest, because we focus on the big stuff. But um, you know, there, there are two or three things um, during that period of time um, that stick in your mind as as really great memories, it, and it doesn't have to be, you know, 2011 at World Cup. It could be that at home, but it also yeah, yeah. might be things that you help. Implement the fit, the flat back line obviously was something that took a while to bed in, but it, it really bore fruit, you know. Yeah, it was. Uh, it's always been a frustration to me that, uh, you know, if you look from 2004 to 2011, led by the great Graham Henry, you know, working with my mates, you know, Steve Hanson, a staff that were really supportive. You know, we played 103 tests in that period, and we won 89 of them. Wow, we. 89 out of 103, <laughs> but we were dog tucker until we won yeah. that final against France, and that's something that really annoyed me. That yeah, we got a, um, the Lions series was great, and that second test in Wellington yeah. shone DC's a spotlight so, yeah. on on how great DC was, but not just DC, others yeah. in the team. Um, you know, Tana was skipper and magnificent, and. Um, Richie, of course, and, and those other, you know, the other players that become Centurions, 
all magnificent. So it was great. Um, winning a Grand Slam, the first since 78, was pivotal for us. Yeah. Um, 2006 was one of the most... Uh, it was incredible, that tour. We, um, we played 115 against Wales, and then we changed the whole 15 yeah. to play Ireland, and we beat Wales, I think, 45-6, and, and Ireland 40... Four seven or something like that, with two different fifteens. Yeah. yeah, it was phenomenal. Um, then we when had one of the greatest performances I think ever was against France in yeah. Lyon. Played with uh, Poppy. It was on Armistice Day. Played with the Poppy on the sleeve, and um, we won that forty seven nine I think on Armistice Day, and I'll never forget the build up that test probably one of the best build-ups I've been involved in so yeah they, they for us they were great years but we still haven't won a World Cup so yeah that, that, that's okay but you haven't won a World Cup <laughs> and 2007 was going to prove very difficult <laughs> and post 2007 was often very difficult because we hadn't won a World Cup no issues signing up again after 2007, Smith. I know it was Ted's job to go in and sort of pitch, but but you were oh. you were up for the challenge now. Oh, you know. jeepers! That, that wasn't easy. It took a while. Um, we discussed it pretty early. Ted's whole thing was: boys have always stood up for us. We've got to stand up for the boys. We've got to put our names forward. Yep. And so Steve and I agreed. Yep, 100%. But we didn't get to interview, which uh, disappointed me. Yeah, I thought Ted should have been allowed to take us yeah. in as part of his interview because we were a team he wasn't able to and um yeah I, look i didn't think we would get it but i was proud of the fact that we had the guts to stand again even though the whole country was against us and particularly where i was living you know mm. down in christchurch <laughs> totally um you know it was yeah there was i won't lie that they were difficult times yeah and you definitely knew who your who your good mates were over the next three or four years down there. Mate, I know uh, you, you referenced 2011 then. Uh, you're a guy, when I look at you on the TV, even now, plenty of composure, but uh, were you pacing the, the coach's box in 2011? <laughs> I was in the grandstands. Um, I was no good. No good at all. Um, you know, <laughs> how are you going? Uh, worse than no good. <laughs> uh, I had bruised ribs for a start because oh. I was sitting next to Ted and he was... He had the old wings going, <laughs> his elbows were hitting me in the ribs. and So I got up and went back to where the water cooler was and grabbed a glass of water and stood up and watched the last sort of 10 minutes. I was OK. I thought, so long as we haven't got the ball, I think we're OK. Yeah. Because Can't give away a Andy Ellis yeah. had come on. He was um, organised the defence well. And you could hear him, you know, on your feet, on your feet, give a metre. Yeah. Keep your hands out, keep your hands out, come over here. You know, and he was organising everything brilliantly. What would have worried me is if we'd had a pass interceptor or something because the yeah, French yeah. were able to do that. Yeah. And so every time they had the ball, they, they basically went backwards, backwards, backwards. Um, they didn't take a drop at goal because they were under pressure. And yeah, um, and it's difficult to tell the whole story how emotional it is because I know Ted's often said he was trying to think of countries that didn't play rugby, so you're going to live there. <laughs> and, and yeah, but. but but you are thinking, I don't think I'm going to be able to live here. Maybe live somewhere in New Zealand, but not going to live where I do live. <laughs> um, but that's the if thing. If you talk to Rich, you talk to Snake Conrad. It's like it wasn't. It was we must win this. <laughs> you know, it, it got to that stage, hadn't it? Yeah, yeah. And there's some more greats of the game. Oh, mate, Snake, Snake nah. legend. Um, he was he was huge in 2000. Yeah. Snakey, yeah. And yeah, absolutely. And Richie, um, I, there's probably not, not another person in the world I can think of who would do what he did yeah. in 2011 where, with a broken bone, yeah. being a moon boot most of the week, take it off, train on Thursday, play on Saturday, back in the moon boot. Yeah. Like, how, how do you do that? Yeah. <laughs> it's unheard of. <laughs> yeah. But it, um, and then you, you just got to imagine what that does to the team yeah. when they see that from their skipper. Yeah, and we had a lot of challenges in that 2011 campaign, didn't we? With um, and the biggest one, of course, DC. 
Perry's kicking goals by the end of the tournament, mate. People forget that sort of stuff. You know, Perry yeah. Wapu, who wasn't even necessarily starting halfbacks, kicking goals. Kicking goals, and he's also a leading field kicker because yeah. we thought, let's change the game now that DC's gone and we'll kick from nine. So he's in front of most of the players by the time he's kicked. We get a better chase line. So it actually worked quite well because a lot of teams would have prepared for playing against um, DC. Um, but yeah, it was. Um, yeah, they, they were interesting times because uh, we were under a lot of pressure. Uh, I'll never forget when DC pulled yeah. that or tore that groin, and it was cl- you know it was obvious to everyone that he was gone. And we got in the shed, and Ted gave one of his great speeches. It was only a little speech, but it was all about DC's gone, boys. But we're going to win this thing. I don't know who we're going to get in, but we're going to win this thing. And that's where our mindset is. And, you know, it just sort of galvanised the boys. And um, But, yeah, it was really difficult. I remember going up with Richie to Dan's room that night. He was heading off to Aussie, I think, the next day to, to get operated on. And, yeah, we, we're probably not all big talkers anyway, but I don't think anything was really said. Yeah. Richie and I just sort of sat there and looked downcast. And oh, yeah. DC was downcast and... Certain point got up and said, "Oh well, better go, mate. Yeah. <laughs> See what you can later." You say in that situation, yeah, uh, bloody difficult. That's what makes it. Two th- there's many things that make 2015 special, defending the World Cup, etc. Um, it was a good side, but the thing I love the most by a country mile, I, I love seeing Rich, um, you know, defend the World Cup as skipper. But I love seeing DC not just out there playing in the final and winning the World Cup, but actually some of those big moments that were his as well. Yeah, um, a couple of the kicks, the drop kick. Like, um, I'm, I'm just, it's awesome he had those moments. Well, isn't it phenomenal that he can come back? The whole country thought he was gone. Oh, totally. He's getting written off, man. He thought he was gone. Yeah. But isn't it phenomenal that he can come back and then he ends up kicking the last conversion with his right foot and seals his career in Player of the Year? So, I mean, <laughs> World Player of the Year. I mean, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. Oh, totally. Like, as it, it is, it's so cool. Um, Smithy, the All Black podcast is powered by ECP, pride themselves on running the best run teams. You've been a part of so many good moments, not just matches, but but moments and games. Is, is there anything that stands out to you as, as best run and maybe why that is? Um, I'd love to ask you, Smithy, about, um, and maybe you're going that way, the move we see a lot on on um, on the highlights against Aussie, the, oh. the miss pass and... Yeah, the one where it um, looks like we're going to do a maul yeah. and then Jonah does a cut off it. Totally. Yeah, um, Andrew Merton saw that space, so uh, he we'd played that play often and the catch was, you know, are they going to maul it or are they going to give it to Jonah? And as as Mertz was always a dummy runner going around the outside, um, he just realised that that's where the space was. Yeah. And so we practised it. Um, there were some little clever things about it in those days. So we only had one lifter on the jumper as a back, back lifter on a, on a back jumper so that we didn't give the cue away. Um, yeah, a lot of things about that. that. That was frustrating for me, that game, because it was a game of high invention by oh. both teams and where the game previously that we'd won in Sydney was called the game yep. of the century. Um, the, the game in Wellington was actually higher quality, if you have a look at it. Yeah. And... There was obviously, there was clearly a view from everyone that next time the ball goes out, the game's over. So Larkham kicks that yeah. 22 drop out. Tana lets it go into touch. Yeah. Tony and I are walking down. We're halfway down the stairs to go and pick up all the trophies because we won everything. And we're told to play on. I, st- I still look back. I don't regret much, but I still look back at regret at that, that decision. Um, by the ref and what happens subsequently. Yep. Um, what will be will be, but um, chain I, st- of events, though, I isn't still it? regret that Yeah. Uh, that because it, it was unfair, I thought. Mate, well disappointed. You must look back. That was, like you say, that was perhaps the, the Bledisloe Cup rivalry at its peak, not just in the between the two teams, but in the skill level. Like, you look back at those, those games will hold up anywhere, anytime. There's some seriously good code being played, and I think that's what you're pointing to in the, yeah. in the Wellington match. You know, like, 
it's sort of, I mean, goodness gracious, a lot kicked the winning penalty. You know, like that was that was what's going on <laughs> at the time. You know, like that was that was the rugby at the time, and it was it was it was high quality. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> it was. There were some phenomenal players oh, in yeah. both those teams. You know, and you had a there was equity. You never knew who was going to win. Aussie had as many of the best players in the world as we did, um, so they're always tight, and um, that's the way it was. It'd be good to get back to that. You know, I think yeah. um, I don't know what the answers are to to boost um, that competition between us and Aussie. At one point, I had said to Ted at one point when he was head coach, maybe we should make the um, Ramfilly Shield up for every game. Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that bring the crowds back in? Yeah. And give the Aussies, um, you know, I reckon it would be really good for the game. Yeah. How do we think about it for about two seconds? They <laughs> 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 no, weren't keen. But um, yeah, maybe, you know, we, our DNA is about, you know, reinventing ourselves and being adventurous. And I reckon that would be a really cool thing to do. Yeah, mate. I love it. <laughs> Mate, we shouldn't talk about this next bit because you're meant to be retired. You're meant to be just doing a few, a bit of consulting here and there and going off to Japan and, and you know, um, coming down here to Waihi Rugby Club and, and helping out the grassroots game. But actually ended up being head coach of the Black Ferns last year. Like, you know, what was what was your connection to the women's game to even, for that even to be on your radar, for that to even be an option? Well, I, I'd had a long connection with women's game through Laurie O'Reilly, who was my... Not just my coaching mentor, but my great great mate, and um, he had had me involved back in the eighties with his crusadettes at um, Canterbury University. I go along sometimes and coach. You know, there were women like Jackie Apiata there, who was Blackfin number one, Natasha Wong, um, Mary Mary Davy. They all became staff coaches for me actually in the eighties when I was um, uh, director of rugby. Um, Helen Littleworth, who was yeah. a great captain, um, great. Th these were great pioneers of women's rugby, and I got to have some sort of involve involvement with them. Not a lot, but um, I was learning all the time under Laurie. I then in '97, I got um, after the Super Rugby season, I got put into the Black Ferns as a technical advisor for Daryl Suasua. Now, he didn't need a technical advisor. Yeah, I thought he was a great coach from what I could see there. But anyway, I happened to get a couple of tests with, <laughs> yeah. with the Black Ferns. And uh, we played, we stayed and played out at Burnham Military Camp. Yes. Played a test match against England, who were World Cup champions the year before. Played them at Burnham. At Burnham. In front, right in front of, I played there. In front of a man, <laughs> a man and a dog. And amongst the trees, yeah. And it was a great Black Ferns team that. It was a great era coming up for the, for the Black Ferns. We had Lewis Wall and Anna Richards and Anna Leah Rush and you know oh, some of the some of the greats of all time, and we beat England 67 nil. Holy <laughs> heck! Out at Burnham Camp, <laughs> never forget it. Um, I was also that year. I was also I was yeah that that's the year I was um, head coach of the New Zealand Under 19s, and Cowboy Shaw was my assistant. <laughs> And because I was coaching the Crusaders, he had to do all the work around the provinces. He was fantastic. He set up all the trial games and was reporting back all the time. So we had a hell of a lot of fun with that game. We played um, Australia 19s at Melbourne Cricket Ground and Curtin Rose of the All Blacks. So, yeah, it was a fun year. But, yeah, I'd had a long involvement with the women. Um, and then the decision to... All I did really was have breakfast with... Mark Robinson and suggest that Glenn Moore and Johnny Haggard and Wes Clark in particular were all mates of mine. If I wanted a hand on the grass sometime, I'd be available. You know, I'd like to help them. I'd seen the games, had a few ideas and wanted to share them. Um, and then, as it transpired, that mental health review came out. Um, coaches resigned. Glenn resigned after about an, another week. And I was stuck in the middle. I still remember my first interview where um, they asked me what, basically, 
um, what was I going to change for the team? And I said, look, I applied for the pension two days ago. <laughs> <laughs> give, me a bit of, give me a bit of time here to settle in. You know? <laughs> but I, I did say, um, yeah, we're going to play an attacking game. Yeah. Um, we got nothing to lose. We're going to be true to our genes and we're going to, we're going to teach these girls how to play an attacking game. I love it. And like by now, you've run any number of campaigns. You've been involved in any number of um, you know teams. How do you evaluate the challenge in front of you? The, sh- the runway was short, you know, like it was a short runway. Uh, it was it was a fantastic opportunity, I suppose. But um, you know, did you think, you know, in the deep inside your Smithy, did you think, you know, we can do this, or or you just week at a time? Um, well, initially, probably not. I I made a bold statement to them, which. I think everyone in the country knows, uh, but my very first talk with them, I said, we're going to win the World Cup at Eden Park in front of 40,000, and but we're just not going to win it today. We've got a lot of work to do. And so, but it became, and, and at the start, you know, I just thought, it, like it's a game. Games are supposed to be fun. Let's work out a way that we can have a lot of fun together. But it became obvious within two weeks that there was huge quality you, know, you just see it. You, you give you give these women a bit of logic about what you want them to do, and they'll do it, and they take it to an extreme. So it's not just on the field. You'll be on the bus home from training, and someone will get up on the mic and go, oh, we weren't too good at that today, girls. Let's go upstairs and do a bit of work. Smithy will come up, and let's make sure we're clear on everything to do. So they dedicate themselves to, to the learning of things that they feel are logical. And so... That was the that was the road we took. I good good coaches like Wes Clark was outstanding, Whitney Hanson was outstanding, Mike Cron I've always thought's the best coach in the world. So we were the four. We worked together, um, not always on the same page, but generally um, we would get there. You know, we'd disagree and commit. The game plan was hugely attacking, um, but as I said before, you got to teach the skills to be able to play that sort of game. But these girls were highly capable of playing the game that we wanted to play. And, the, and you know, we took 32 to the World Cup. We were looking at 55 women. Wow. The, the, some, some of the, the greats of the game missed out on that yeah, team. Yeah. And there's some future greats of the game that missed out and it wasn't quite right time for them. But, um, yeah, it, was, it wasn't an easy process because I didn't know a lot of them. Easy process to determine, should I take it to the World Cup or not? And so some of those selection meetings were... Where um, there's a lot of debate. Generally, I would go with the like we had about we had five selectors essentially, and I'd normally go with the majority. Yep. The odd time, odd time I I, I didn't. It was only probably once or twice. The rest of the time, I just went with a Smithy override. The yeah, there's the odd Smithy override. Not many. Cool. Um, yeah, I overrode Ted a couple of times during the tournament. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had a couple of interesting conversations. He was a huge help. Yeah. So having him on board and, and Alan Bunting coming on board to take over the... I was, I was feeling a bit under pressure because I was doing the leadership stuff and the, the cultural stuff as well. He's an expert at that, so he came in and took that over. Ted's probably the best analyst I've, I've ever known, and so he was looking at the other teams for me. He was also um, mentoring a couple of the coaches... But he was looking at other teams. We would we would swap our clips. We'd chat about the games coming up. We'd done a lot of homework from the previous year as well on what to expect. So we're pretty much all on the same page about how, we, how we're going to play, and we had no option. We couldn't play a traditional game and beat France or England. So everyone understood that. The only the only problem at the end was the girls saw. The attacking opportunity in every situation, and couldn't you couldn't turn them around? Couldn't turn the tap off. Stop them. No. <laughs> <laughs> what you look? What you had created, Smithy? But <laughs> <laughs> Mate, there's so much of it. You know, as I often say, we've all we've all got our our memories from it. I do. Like I went to a couple of games. I loved it. You know, there's you know just watching it in a different environment with different people to what I normally watch rugby with. Talking about it differently, like embracing the game differently, was awesome. Um, I want to ask a couple of things. Um, you know, firstly around Rua Hay, like was it an obvious decision for her to be skipper? God, listening to you speak now around um, 
flat attack. God, is there a, a better player in women's rugby around being able to play flat attack at, from 10? Like, she, she lived in the opposition yeah. line, you know, yeah. like almost too flat, you know. Yeah. But um, firstly, um, her as a skipper, it was a new skipper. You had to pick a new skipper. Yeah. Um, was that a no-brainer or, or did you have to put a lot of thought to that? It wasn't a no-brainer initially because I didn't know who she was. I don't know who a lot of the girls were that first um, week at training. But at the end of the week, we played a game against the Lincoln University Academy boys. Right. And it was outstanding. They were fantastic. Like They helped coach. They gave feedback afterwards. They were too fast for our girls at that point. Um, they were too good. I think they might have scored about 10 tries against us. Aisha scored one try against them. But I, went out, I went out on the field for the fourth quarter and we made some changes and one of the changes was Ruhei who I didn't know I didn't know what position she played but she spoke to the team and, and essentially the message was well, Smithy's been training us all week to attack and playing an attacking game we've got all the bits and pieces why aren't we bloody doing it like we've got to take some chances here girls and so I go back to the stand, to a little, there's only a little stand there, and I, I went back and I was sitting beside Wes Clark and asked him who that girl was who was speaking. He said, that's oh, Ruhe DeMont. I said, is she, um, like, is she, uh, has she been a black fern? He said, yeah, yeah, she's been a black fern. Is she a um, starter? Oh, not really. She's sort of more a 12 than a 10. He said, she's played a few games, not really a starter. I said, well, she's going to be my captain. <laughs> he had the shot look on his face. <laughs> hey, I said, she's going to be my captain because she gets it. Yeah. You know, and then I watched her play, the game improved, and, yeah, I just stuck to it. Yeah. And then it's a big job to be a captain, and it became bigger and bigger as the, the yeah. support and the community started getting behind us. So um, we ended up um, agreeing, Ruhe and I, that she needed a... A co-captain, the ideal person was Kennedy Simon, yep. and so we went down that track as well, and that, that worked out brilliantly well. So, a lot of luck, I suppose. You know, sometimes you got to back your, well, your gut. No. Some would say you know what you're doing, mate. Some would say you know what you're doing. But there's, um, as I said, the the tournament, you know, lived in our club rooms and lounges. We've all got our moments. But in terms of um, the women's game, the Black Ferns maybe in particular, what would you like to see next? Because climbed Everest in some regards, you know, gone from um, you know, a home World Cup, something you achieved with the men, and, and now you've achieved it um, with the Black Ferns. What would you like to see next? Well, there's a lot of investment going on from New Zealand rugby, so it's, it's hugely positive. Um, what would I like to see? There's, there's going to be a lot of women coming to the game, I think, a lot, lot of young women coming to the game. Um, there, there needs to be better facilities, you know, clubs need to have changing facilities, showers, um, they don't get rid of some of the urinals and <laughs> turn them into proper toilets, maybe. Yeah. Um, so that's a big project. And, yeah, the competition's got to be improved. Yeah, you know, you, you can't exist on a super opicky competition like they played this year for any for any length of time. It's, 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 I mean, it was fine. But you've got the same teams playing each other each mm. week, you know. And, um, possibly the Aussie... Um, provincial teams might not be good enough yet so yeah I don't really know I personally um, I don't know I'd, I'd probably have a look at playing the provincial teams in a longer competition and go down that track yep. rather than super you don't have to don't have to be part of the super clubs you know they can mother two of they're their own entity yep. for example they're not they're not crusaders so um, maybe we can create more or get the provinces in, the top provinces in, and maybe even have two divisions, um, but expand it that way. And then I think the Aussie teams would be really competitive with our provincial teams, and we could, they could, and and then you got the um, Drua, oh, no, not Drua, but the Fijian team that's yeah. pretty good, and Samara got a pretty good team as well. Um, Tonga not so much yet, but bring them in as well, and you could create a really special competition, I reckon. 
If we don't, like we're falling mile behind because of the Six Nations. Yeah. You know, that's been played all the time. They've There's got a, domestic leagues, don't they? Yeah. A yeah. massive game coming up, isn't there, next yeah. week um, between England and France. They've sold more than 50,000 already for Twickenham. It's going to go past the World Cup final as the highest selling. Already has. Game. Already has. They've even started. They've still got another <laughs> week to go. <laughs> so, uh, and they've been professionalised for, you know, two years before the Black Ferns and yep. way ahead of the world. So, um, we've got to get cracking yep. and make sure that, you know, we s- and, and we and the New Zealand are now serious about promoting it. There's a lot of ideas going around at the moment, so it's a matter of bringing them all together and and putting a system in place. Oh, mate, it, it was awesome, and it's great to see the game booming. Uh, finish on this, Smithy, last section. Just talk a little bit about the rugby lands- landscape and the upcoming Rugby World Cup. You know, you are a student of the game, and, you know, when you look at international rugby these days and all the things that, you know... I think sometimes get a little bit too much uh, coverage as line sp- defensive line speed, and tackle heights and cards and all that sort of stuff. But um, what do you think on the firstly the quality of the international game at the moment? Like you've you've looked after it, you've been involved with it for so many years. Do you think the standards good? You know, oh, the, the standards great in terms of the quality of the players that you see all around the world. Um, but I don't know about you, but. Man, I'm getting frustrated with the game, not the players. I'm frustrated with the game. I, I watched um, the game that Nick Berry refereed yep. the other day, yep. and the arms out the whole time. Yep. Every single play, there's an advantage. Then you know we're going to go seven, eight phases. If it goes no, we're going to come back. It's going to be a penalty. Your 30 seconds to kick the ball into touch. 40 seconds for the line out to happen. There's going to be a drive. Um, that's going to collapse, there's going to be a harm come out, it's going to come back to another penalty, another kick to touch, another drive. Um, then a yellow card comes out because they do it again. Mm. And I turned off for the first time in my life at half time and I went to watch. Um, I actually put on uh, program on the lions in Serengeti. <laughs> <laughs> I watched an animal documentary. I was so go. frustrated with it. I don't know if it got any better in the second half, but um, probably did. But I just thought uh, it's not a game I want to watch at the moment when it's like that. Yeah. Um, and the cause I've of that come out, I've come out and spoken publicly around the line out drive and, and malls in particular. And I reckon one thing that would fix that if you don't like malls like me or you don't like continual malls is if you get the penalty and a kick to touch the other team gets the throw in uh, yeah. and yep. that would stop yep. all these incessant kicks down to the corner and driving malls and malls that fall over and then another one and then another one and then another one you know it's um, that's what I that's what I'd like to see um, some of the law changes are um, pretty minor the ones that are I don't know if they quite having the effect that they wondered when they made them. That would have a big effect. Does that and, come and back if you to had to play off the penalty yeah. or a scrum, and if the scrum goes down, you've got to play off that that penalty or that place kick or that um, free kick rather than keep doing scrum resets. Yep. Those, those those things would make massive difference to the game, I reckon. Yeah. Because a little bit too, and I suppose maybe this is a little bit more on the play and coaching side, but I've heard you say before that you know, there's perhaps not as much of an appetite these days to for innovation and for change to pop your head up above the parapet. I think the way you the way you set it because professionalism maybe will will have it chopped off or you know people. So we're seeing when we watch rugby, we're seeing a lot of the same stuff. You know, would you love to see? I suppose it's hard because it is a vocation, but you know, for for players and coaches to be brave. Yeah, um, you've got to be if if you want to stand out from the crowd and. You don't actually win the tournament. You've got to do something different. You can't just do what everyone else, else did. I just talked about scrums that go down. So Mike Cron, for um, eight years between 2004 and 2011, when he was doing scrum training, he counted how many times the scrum went down. And then the forwards all had to do 10-metre army crawl for every scrum that went down. And he used to start with, like, 15 scrums going down. That's a 150-metre army crawl for big guys and the outstanding thing of that period was how seldom our scrum went down <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sure you can do it if, if, yeah. if the attitude's right between two teams I'm sure you can keep the scrum up 
and maybe if if it does, as I said before, if it goes down, maybe the next scrum's got to be a golden oldie, or you play off a yep. off a penalty, off a free kick, and maybe that'll maybe it'll start forcing teams to to stay up. I know it's a it's a contest, but is it too much of a contest? I don't know, mm. but it's um, I don't know how many people I'm speaking for when I say this about the malls and the scrums, but I bet there's a lot. Yep. Yeah, I'd agree. Rugby World Cup this year. Um, certainly, I mean, it feels like we say this every time the Rugby World Cup comes around, but we've got, or well, even ranked-wise, the four strongest teams on, on the same side of the draw. Um, and, you know, perhaps a true analyst would say the winner will come from one of those four teams, but there's certainly other teams in the tournament who can have a day, you know, who can can knock someone over. Um, you know, for you, is it the two Northern Hemisphere sides are, are best placed at the moment to win the tournament? And are you going to be up there and, and um, involved in any way? Uh, no, I'm not going up because um, I'm there in June anyway. Have, you know, that'll be our travel over for this year. So, um, and it's also the, the games, most of the games have been in a good time zone here, probably yeah. 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 yeah. o'clock in the morning, given. France normally play late at night, so and I like watching every game if I can, rather than just the big ones, you know. And yep. if you're over there, you, you go to a game, and then sometimes you don't see the other game. So I like to keep an eye on all of them. Um, it's going to be hard to pick, I reckon. I, I think you're right in that you got Scotland, Ireland, South Africa in one pool, and New Zealand, and France. France, and Italy in the other. Pretty tough pools. And yeah, possibly, yeah, like most people will be thinking, yeah, you know, they'll play the quarterfinals and whoever it is, whether it's New Zealand against South Africa or New Zealand against um, Ireland, whoever, whichever teams win those two matches, they're on the separate side of the draw mm. and will probably, yeah, you would think they would probably play off in the final. Totally. But then you've got England are a yeah. dark horse, aren't they? Wales with Gats back there, they're going to make some improvement. There's no doubt about that. Aussie, you know, um, Eddie's going to get a lot of players back that Dave Rennie never had yep. because of injury and um, or overseas. He always gets a, an impact anyway. Most new coaches do. Um, I would say they'll, they'll be a bit more of a danger than what people expect. That's going to be interesting to watch. There's some good little si- some stories in all these mm, there are. all these games. I think and it's hard to it's just hard to know who's going to come through because it's very much at the time. Yeah. You know, we we went to the two seven World Cup having beat having put sixty points on France three months earlier in Wellington, yeah. and then lost to them in the quarterfinals. So you just never know. And finally, Smithy, um, you know, perhaps. Where do you see the All Blacks at at the moment? You know, what would you like to see from them? You know, we've got five games um, in the lead up and, and from listening to speak now, that's really important, those five games, to kind of get us to hit the ground running when we get to France and, and we play the host nation in the opening tournament, which is, which is awesome. It's, it's so good. So um, happy with the, the way the lads are tracking, the personnel involved, um, their opportunities to go and, and have a good tournament? Yeah, I think so. And, and to a certain extent, the, the press is off. Fozzie, you know, he's had a lot of, you know, some been some difficult years with COVID. There's been a lot of criticism. The decision's been made for next year. He can, he can say what he likes and pick who he wants and go forward. And I think the, the country will support it. And there'll be no consequences afterwards. So I think he'll give it heaps. And he's got Joe Schmidt with him and Stormy's been there a while, Scott McLeod. Um, Jason Ryan clearly is a, is a difference maker. They've got all the coaching and mental skills ability that you need. And they're going to pick a strong team. That team's going to come out of a super, team, a super rugby competition that hasn't been that tough, mm. unless it's New Zealand against New Zealand team. That's a worry. And I read what Fozzie said in the paper today, and, and I think he's right that some players have to start stepping up regardless of the fact that some of the games have been a bit easy. Got to, you've got to step up if you want to be part of that World Cup team. Um, 
so I, yeah, I've got every confidence that they're gonna they're gonna be tough. They're always All Blacks are always tough to beat, but they're gonna be really tough, I reckon. Smithy, thanks so much, mate. I know we had to keep a few irons in the fire with the book coming out. Looking forward to that. Um, <laughs> is that later in the year? Is it or? Uh, we'll see. I think so. I don't know too much. <laughs> We're extracting enough information out of you for it. <laughs> yeah, don't, no worries about that. <laughs> you ever come across Phil Gifford? I have a little bit. Yeah, he's back a, in cross you say. Yes, yep. he's a great extractor of uh, information. Um, yeah, I'm quite enjoying the process. I, I've never wanted to do one. It yep. was more relentless hunting by <laughs> Gifford that, that talked me into it. It was almost like you have to. Do this is a sixth year, Phil, <laughs> <laughs> and I think he's thought. Sooner or later, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just give in through, yeah, through harassment. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we've started it. See how it goes. Um, yeah, I, hopefully, hopefully it'll be out, you know, end of the year before Christmas. Yeah, I've got the right not to do it if I don't like it. Yep. If I overlook it and go, I don't like it. But I'm gonna have to pay him anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully it's all right. Oh mate, you've been a reader of so many books in your time. I, I have absolutely no doubt. There's going to be some stuff in there for everyone. It'll, it'll be an awesome read, so I, I look forward to it. Thank you so much for today. It was great to come, you know, close to your neck of the woods where you spend spend your days these days, and, yeah. and you know, probably my favourite place. And I think by the sounds of it, yours as well, a community rugby club yeah. um, where all the good stuff happens, where all blacks are made, and, and where you know um, people cut their teeth in their careers. So thank you so much, mate, and um, look forward to catching up again. Pleasure, Rob. Been great. Cheers. The All Blacks podcast is powered by our official cloud software partner, SAP, helping our teams of black be the best run in sports. Hosted by Rob Dunn in the Hargrave Street Studio. Produced by Carl Thompson from Blue and Ginge, the podcast producers. Video editing by Mac Leesberg, graphics by Western Design, content advising from Andy Burt, and commercial manager for the podcast is Valeska Hoth. Follow the All Blacks podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube and anywhere you get your podcasts.